Welcome back, everyone. Part one was such an amazing episode, and uh, thank you for coming back to part two. You talked a lot about doing impressions, right? Growing up, it, so it just seems like, do you steal from the greats? Do you still do you st- Still steal. You still steal. Still steal. Yes. Still. Yeah, I think, steal. I mean, the thing that I've learned, because I've been really fortunate to be on a lot of shows, not on one long show, is that I find that you're usually put in a situation, especially with television, that is kind of a situation that's been in other shows before. So it's an interrogation. It's a breakup scene. It's the bit where you're on the sidewalk and the car drives by and the water splashes on you. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I've seen this and I've seen this and I've seen this. So a lot of times I'll watch other people and see how they did the courtroom scene or how they did whatever these little like jokes may be or bits may be or plot devices or situations or something Um, You mentioned The Politician, which was one of the favorite shows that I've done recently, and I got to do an interrogation. So I would watch great interrogating scenes, and I might steal or be admired or admire what I was seeing when somebody else did that in a great way. So that when I'm faced with that plot device or that storytelling piece, I'll say, oh, I'm getting to do an interrogation scene. I remember this great one and this great one and this great one. In the sense that that might be how I watch somebody and see what they did with it. Um, I love knowing tons of television because that's where I work Mm -hmm. mainly more than movies. So I like knowing they did it this way on this show and this way on this show. And now we're doing it now. And now we're commenting on it in this way. So something like um, Wet Hot American Summer, which is sort of a spoof show that I got to be a part of. They're always commenting on established, you know, tropes and things like that. So I definitely want to know those. That's how I steal when I watch other people because I'll see how they do it. Understand the medium of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was the politician the one with Landfield? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Timothy Landfield? Yeah. 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 My uh, wife's I, a huge fan. I don't know if Again, he was a teacher. You popped up, yeah, you but, popped um, up in my bedroom out of, out of nowhere. It's like, oh, <laughs> there, there, there's Eric. That yeah. was a great show. My gosh. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Tim taught me acting at, at Academy. He, oh, cool. It's his second year and a really great teacher. But you graduated in 1999, yes. right? Um, so you got your first agent <laughs> relatively out of, quickly, quickly out of the gate, yeah, right? Yeah, that summer. Actually, Mm -hmm. Um, there was another friend of ours, Ted Armstrong, who Angel mentioned in her uh, show as well. I guess we were both piggybacking off of Teddy (laughs) because he had an agent at the time. And I sent a letter to his agent and she represented kids all the way up to about 19, 20 year olds. Mm -hmm. And so she took a meeting with me because she said that she felt that people just graduating college were kind of in a dead spot. They weren't young, but they had no credits. So she took a meeting with me. And I brought her the gnarliest monologue that I had taken. Like, pick the, the most traumatic monologue you did in the Academy. You know, the one that just wrecked everyone. I brought that into her office at Hollywood and Vine, and I did it across her desk. And then she's like, that was great. It was probably so emoting. Right. And so, you know. And then she handed me, like, a piece of commercial copy about beef jerky or something. And she's like, can you read that now? <laughs> I was like, you know, beef jerky, yeah. snap into a Slim Jim. And then got an agent in 99, you know, so started auditioning right then, which was amazing wow yeah that, if you were there's a lot of people who don't have agents mm, yeah and you, and you just got out of the school and got one what, what was your what was your method what'd you do how did you how bring did you a gnarly monologue it? and then sell beef jerky well, <laughs> well, yeah well, of course hey, kids. I mean, how did you get <laughs> in the door i mean you gotta you, 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 you I got had to in the find door. her somehow yeah i mean i wrote her the way that i did it <clears> and this back, was back then they used to send out pictures and stuff. right i would i i just somebody told me how to do it at the academy and i listened you know, anytime they ever told me any little thing, I was paying attention constantly because I wanted as much information as I could. So someone said, send a headshot with a cover letter to agents that are your size. And I think it was Lyle Wilson's wife who was a casting director at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she came in and gave a business class. And I just, I listened to everything that anyone ever said. Um, so I physically mailed envelopes. And I just on the letter said to Chester Henry, who was my first agent, that Ted Armstrong was represented and he recommended you to me. And so fortunately I had sent it to agents that were my level, beginner, entry level, you know. And I had a cover letter and she called me in for an audition, which I think was lucky. And then after that, a lot of it is um, making sure you don't make any mistakes that you can avoid making. So don't be late by leaving early. And if there's an accident or traffic, you'll still have time to find parking. 
you won't be nervous if you're not rushing into an audition or a meeting. Diana Stevenson said that to me. She was like, show up early, leave early, get there really early. If nothing goes wrong, grab a cup of coffee and just walk around the block. I still show up to my auditions early. Mm -hmm. I still go get a cup of coffee and walk around because if I can avoid making any mistakes, I will, because mistakes are gonna happen. Right. So you're, you're gonna go really, really long without getting an agent, nobody's gonna take you, but you know, do something to maximize the advantages that you do have so that the one opportunity that shows up doesn't get ruined by something out of your control. Right, don't set yourself up for failure. Yes, exactly, so be ready for anything that might happen, because you walk into these rooms, whether it's meetings with agents or auditions, which are gonna be you know dozens and dozens and dozens a year, hopefully, and it's always gonna be something new and something's always gonna go wrong. So minimize the mistakes as much as you can mm -hmm. um, and then be ready for them. And when they happen, that's now something that can happen. So anytime I go into a situation and something goes crazy, the uh, maybe I rehearse the entire thing with the reader over here and I'm all ready for the reader to be right there. And then when I get there, the reader's over there and I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> I, I did the whole thing over here. So it's a minor little thing that can get pop into your head that throws you off. So rehearse with the reader over here and over here. You know, mm -hmm. so that you're constantly ready for that because now I know that that's something that can happen. Right, and that'll, that'll keep the fluidity of being an actor in play too because you never want to get... Keeps up fresh. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You, know, you get locked into one way of playing something. Yeah, you know, and it's tangible things like showing up early so you're not stressed by traffic to organic creative things like not getting locked into something. Right. But anytime anybody ever tells me something crazy that happened to them in this industry, I just log it as a possibility of something that can happen. Right. Like, that can happen. Great. Julia Duffy wrote a book called Bad Auditions uh, oh. recently, and so it's just all of her bad auditions. Oh, God, I'd love to read it. everything. Yeah, so I'd love great. to read it. I could write it. Right. So, but but you, work on, you worked on heavyweight shows kind of right at the gate. You got X-Files and yeah. VR, and X-Files is one of the more popular episodes, right? Well, yeah, on. Signs so, and yeah. Wonders. And the guy won a, at that time, it was Yeah, huge. it was huge. The guy won a guest Emmy for it. It was about Shakers, which is like mm. a division of Christianity where they hold the snakes. There's like an obscure quote in the Bible that says that they held snakes. Right, so these, yeah. not Quakers, but Shakers in like Appalachian Valley or area there, they would handle snakes. And this guy came in to audition for it. And his family were Shakers. And he said to them, I'm not going to do this if you're going to make fun of them. He's like, my family, because I'm not a Shaker, but I'm not going to make fun of them. And they were like, we'd love you to consult and make sure that we have it right. I happen to be in the teaser of it. I get killed by snakes, but it becomes this like heralded episode of, of the X-Files, which, I mean, it was a big episode, and I don't know if I gained any momentum off of it, but I've been really, really blessed. I was thinking about this on the way up here to be a part of episodes of TV that are like that, which I kind of think is um, God at my back, you know, like filling my right, sails, right. like pushing me along. Like I've been on, I was on the episode of Mad Men that John Hamm quit being yeah. an advertising executive. So I literally right. bored him into retirement. So it's this famous episode at the end of the series where he quits and flies off to, New, uh, to California. I was the guy that sent, you know, Don Draper into retirement. Right. <laughs> I was on X-Files when the Shakers thing did. I did an episode of CSI that was so gory that it shot to the top of the ratings and they realized that CSI needed to be gory and I just happened to be the killer in that particular episode. I've been really fortunate just to be in and around a lot of great people, which makes me proud of my career, even though I don't necessarily have a signature show that I was on for a long time. I got a lot of really cool shows that I've been a part of, you know? It, it, yeah, it's, that's, it's by that's, very definition, an actor. Someone yes. Who has all those different roles. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah. You landed a pretty good, easy uh, gig that same year. Uh, Malcolm in the Middle? Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of great TV shows. We were talking about a great TV yeah. show. A oh, great we just, TV show. We just rewatched uh, the whole thing. My son and my daughter. My son's 14. My daughter's 8. Binged the entire thing. And it's so great. How was, that? How, how, how was the audition for that? How'd you... I, uh, I missed it. I missed the callback. I was late. I was... <laughs> Stuck in traffic. Which is completely the opposite of what you just told us not to do. This is how I learned how to show up early. Stuck in traffic. And then, and then like, they called me back for another session or something. Like, they didn't find it. So I went to another session later or the next day. And I remember walking into the room and saying, like, I'm so sorry about what happened yesterday, but the producers didn't know about it. I think it maybe the session had fallen apart. Like, grace happened for me. And they're like, what are you talking about? Ken Coppice was the director's name. And I was like, nothing, don't worry about it. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah. And then I got that, and they were looking for military academy kids. And I had a shaved head and looked like I was in the military. I was playing a, you know, an a-hole, which is what I usually play, especially so in those young. days. So, I was a baby. So yeah. young at that point. And then I started recurring on it, and it um, taught me how to be on TV shows. Because the creator, Linwood Boomer, he had great people from the top all the way down to the bottom. 
and he was so warm and engaging, but also professional and on it. Brian Cranston, like, oh, set, I mean, I got spoiled by it because I just thought that that's how everybody was. Good people, very hardworking, never complaining. I remember late in season three when I was on it, I had like soot from a oven that was pouring down on top of me and they used cookie crumbs to do it. And at one point I got a little, little like, irrit- I mean, it's popping in my eye and mm-hmm. the camera messes up or something like that. And I was just like, oh my gosh, can, can we get this? And the one guy was like, oh, I'm sorry, do you have soot on you? Because every character on the show throughout every season had slime and goop right. and bananas <laughs> and everything. And they were like, oh, Eric, is it your turn to get slime now? And I was like, you're right, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, kind of a humbling experience. A little bit, like yeah. just that one little snap of like irritation. They were like, you're on Malcolm in the Middle, dude. And I was like, you're right, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> put, put more cookies on me because they never they never complained I'm sure they complained you know but they set a standard for me Jane Katzmerich was incredible Brian I was fortunate enough to go to the Emmys um, with my lovely bride I was the eye candy she was the nominee um, so I'm on the red carpet and I have no pressure on me I whatsoever she has something to say about that <laughs> <laughs> no I'm a trophy husband she'll admit it. <laughs> and Brian Cranston is I mean if you ever get a chance to go to the Emmys red carpet, go, okay? Because um, it's <laughs> awesome, um, well, especially yeah. when you have no pressure on you. So I'm wandering around just like a you know kid in a candy store, and Brian Cranston is there, and this is after Breaking Bad. This is um, five years ago, and he's huge. And, and, I, and I walk by him, and I'm like, Brian. And he looks at me for a second, and he goes, Eric. I was on the show for two seasons, the yeah. second and the third season. And he took a while, and he looked at me, and he's like, how the hell are you, man? And I'm like, I'm like, I'm great. Congratulations. So good to see you. He's like, thanks. And then he walks away a little bit and he stops and he turns back and he goes, look at you, all grown up. And then walks away again. And I was like, I can't believe this man. And that was who taught me how to be on set. And he was the same back then as he was the day I saw him. You know, on the, on the biggest that was show really on television. Cool. Yeah. I actually saw your face. Come First off, morph. I was about to say that was a great impression. <laughs> Second off, just kind of morphed into it. Yeah, this, and Brian Cranston is one of those actors that. that I always turn to, uh, well, one, it's an inspiration for me, but when, when I talk about these kind of things, because he didn't get Malcolm until what he was like, almost oh, 50, yeah. something there. And that's yeah, what, old, that's, definitely later. Yeah, that's know. when he shot up. But I remember when I was a kid watching him on Chips. Oh my gosh, you know? yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that's, not that I remember when Chips aired, but yeah. I, my dad used to watch it. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I do. But, but first run, like, I saw he, it first run. Yeah, he struggled. You know, and mm-hmm. then he got Malcolm in the middle so late in his life. Yeah. And that's what people, some people just don't understand. So sometimes the right role doesn't come along for you until that late. And now he's one of the, one of the greats. I we mean, consider one of the greats. We would, you know? would all wish for his career. I, I had a, mm-hmm. another colleague of mine put it in perspective where he said, if you had to wait till you were 40 or 50, and then you could have Brian Cranston's career, would you wait for that? And you're like, yeah, of course I would wait for that. Okay, then maybe just sit and let things play out mm-hmm. and Chill, keep doing yeah. all these, yeah, keep doing, doing these jobs along the way because it can happen for a different time for everybody, you know? Yeah. I never wanted to shoot right up. I mean, I did, but I also realized that if you shoot up, you kind of don't have a lot of stability, mm. you know, because you've only got this track, whereas if you can build your career like his, where it goes out this way and then goes up, you've got a stronger foundation. So there's something to working for a long time before you have to work with everybody watching you, <laughs> yeah. you know? But do you really have a choice to right. build your career that way? I mean, you know, you know No, you're right, you gotta take it. I'm build my career this you're way. Right. Right. You just, you know? This you is just, just what I tell myself. You're gonna do what you gotta do. But yeah, I mean, you did, you, you, you shot up relatively quickly coming out of high school, mm-hmm. but then you got, uh, high school, uh, College Academy. Academy. Yeah. Uh, but you also got Jeepers Creepers too. Oh man. Right? You landed that? Yes. That movie. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I like it took that you, movie. It took you two to land that one, didn't yes. you? The auditions. <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah. That was a good one. I remember auditioning for the first time and I was um, like, this is terrible. You know, this is the monster movie. And I'm coming out of the Academy too, so everything's not Shakespeare anymore. <laughs> and then I get a call back for it and I'm like, it's a, it's a decent film. You know, like it's, you know, it got some stuff. <laughs> and then I booked the part and I was like, I'm in a studio film, you know, like, uh, you know. I'm in a feature. I'm <laughs> in a yeah, feature. exactly, exactly. No, that was, that was awesome. I mean, it was a big budget studio horror movie that I got to be in and we did press for it and we went to premieres and everything. Um, it was great. It was great, mm. you know. What do you do to stay fresh? Keep studying. Yeah? You know? You, yeah. You, you keep I think studying? you have to keep I keep think you have to keep training, stay in class, get people to challenge you, be around other people that are good, that inspire you. Um, it's probably a good idea to think that if you're working with a group of actors that you're not as good as the rest of them. <laughs> I don't know if that's an insecurity thing. No, no, no. But it's kind of good to be like, man, they're so great. They're so great. They're so great. I gotta get better. I gotta get better. I find I pull myself up when I'm yeah. around those actors. Yeah, you yeah. You definitely don't want to get complacent. So I think doing that and then inspiring yourself 
you know, with television and, and you know, walks to the beach and music and, you know, <laughs> everything that you can do. A lot of times people think that in their job that they'll finish doing their work and then they'll treat their some, uh, treat themselves to something like going to the beach and watching the sunset. And what actors forget sometimes is that that's part of your work is going to the beach and watching the sunset because mm -hmm. that's gonna inspire you. It's not something that you do after you're finished doing your work. It's something that will clear your head and help you work. Right. You know, right. so you don't sit there because also as actors, we can't work. We have to fill our time until we have a project that we're working on. Um, so stuff like that helps to keep inspiring you. Right, acting's not a job, it's a livelihood. Yeah, it really it's, is, it's, right? It's a lifestyle, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. You, to, I mean, you, you, yeah. you set yourself up to it. Uh, so you started getting work right out of the academy, and you've worked ever since, and it's just been wonderful, right? Yeah, yeah right, is nonstop. You, you, is that yeah, the story? you went through a little bit of a rough patch mm -hmm. for, for after Jeepers Creepers 2. And, yeah, and that, yeah, so I did Jeepers Creepers 2. Um, I did two pilots, comedy pilots, that didn't go, so no one ever mm -hmm. saw them. And then I probably went around two and a half to three years without booking any thing you know um which was tough because as a young guy you think you've got it especially when you start working right away i mean i'd be lying if i didn't tell you that some of those nights i thought this is easy you know mm -hmm. like Psh, i got this and i didn't keep acting i didn't keep in class i didn't keep training and i got complacent i also had a lot of life changes that were overwhelming you know what i mean i was 26 i was married and we had our son so I had a brand new baby in the house, you know. I was earning my salary as an actor and then also bartending at the same time, but I had been in Jeepers Creepers too, so that's really a shot to the ego. I was a messenger around town, um, so I was taking scripts and packages around town, driving them um, to different office buildings, and across the street would be a movie theater that had my movie in it. <laughs> because I didn't get paid a ton of money, but I had already spent all that money because it was a year later. So that's weighing on me. You know, my, my, it's, it's making me uh, not trust myself anymore and feel terrible about myself, right. of course. Like it's this very humbling thing and, it, and I had to, I'm glad that I went through it because it makes you a better person. But um, I also had tragedy in my life happen. Um, my, my sister passed away um, about a month after my son was born. So you've got these Ooh. real life, yeah, she never actually met him, unfortunately, because um, uh, we were out here and she was in Chicago. So I have a brand newborn baby. I haven't worked in a little bit anyway. You know, my sister passes away, who I love dearly um, and still do. And so now you're dealing with life stuff while you're trying to pursue a career. Because when you're young, it's easy. You don't carry any burdens, you know, and if it's working, it works. And you just keep doing it. So you get, you, you have know, no mouths to feed. Yeah, you have no mouths <laughs> to feed or anything own. like that. So I've got this stuff weighing on me now. Um, and it's not something that you can tell everybody. You can't walk into an audition. There's just something in front of you. There's a cloud in front of you. There's a heaviness in front of you. There's an insecurity now because you haven't worked in a while in front of you. And what I've learned and what I tell actors all the time is that so much of this career and this lifestyle, like you say, is a mental game of getting all of the extra stuff out of the way that you don't need, whether it's baggage or just like fears or things that are going to hold you back. You got to clear your head. And that's why it's important to either challenge yourself or keep studying or clear your mind by doing something that fills your soul because you're gonna be asked to use all of you. And if any part of you is somewhere else being burdened down or being used for something else, that just means that you have less of you that you can show everybody mm -hmm. and it's kind of in the way and we can see it. So for two and a half years, I was carrying that. And then by the grace of God, I got Generation Kill, um, which took me away because it was uh, something that we shot abroad and I and I could get back into the game and come back like a new a new man. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and and that's that was what I was going to bring up next was in two thousand eight. You, yeah. you kind of got that. You know, somebody was watching out for you, and Generation Kill comes along. It was great. That was a huge, huge television show. Huge, huge. I mean, yeah. amazing. And the job that I'm most proud of. You know, right. because oh, um, good. It yeah. was uh, it was an HBO series about uh, the second Iraqi war, Iraqi freedom, and it was written um, by an embedded reporter for Rolling Stone, so everything was true. He turned his story into a book, and then HBO turned it into a miniseries. The guys who developed it for television were Ed Burns and David Simon, who wrote The Wire. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, they've done a bunch of stuff since then, so it was this amazing project. And at the same time, we went and shot it in three countries in Southern Africa. And so, I mean, I got this chance to travel to see the world that I never thought I would see. I'm friends with all the guys to this day. It was, you know, 30 plus, you know, American actors playing Marines. And they were awesome all the way down the line. They were all great. And so something like that can come along.